Drew Richard is an American writer, journalist, and literary translator. From 2011 to 2016, he covered Japan's African community for the Japan Times. His writing has appeared in publications such as Counterpunch and the New York Times, and he divides his time between Massachusetts and Abia State, Nigeria. In conversation with him tonight, we have Stacey Kranitz. Working within the documentary tradition, she makes photographs that acknowledge the limits of photographic representation. Her, image do, her images do not tell the truth, but are honest about their inherent shortcomings and thus reclaim these failures, exoticism, ambiguity, fetish, fetishization, as sympathetic equivalents in order to more forcefully convey the complexity and instability of the lives, places, and moments they depict. Ain't No Grave Gonna Hold My Body Down visualizes resistance and activism associated with the failures of rural health care in Appalachia by providing resources for residents to solve the resulting problems. Utilizing pamphlets as a medium, Kranitz partners with local health organizations and residents in central Appalachia to address problems associated with dental care, medical debt, black lung disease, drug use, and treatment, and the impact of hospital closures. You'll see more links about that in the chat. And now for the book, renowned literary translator Geraldine Harcourt has called Drew Richards' Japan instantly grim, yet always worthy of love, declaring that every human intention may be the last great work of expatriate writing from Japan. Richards' deeply literary and thoroughly researched account illuminates the lives of Nigerian immigrants trapped by Japan's troubled immigration system, nuclear scientists struggling to reform their industry after Fukushima, and the aging residents of Japan's northernmost city. Called Keenly Observed by Publishers Weekly, a compelling study of contemporary Japan by Robert Earle and a moving and enlightening read by Ha Jin, every human intention deserves a spot on the shelf of every person in attendance tonight. RJ Julia is so grateful to have Drew and Stacy here in conversation today, and I'm going to let them take it away. Okay, so I think everybody can hear us now, and I think um, Abby and Erica will tell us if they can't. Um, and if we start looking away, we promise to stop doing it and remember to, to look at the camera because we see you through the computer. Um, although I guess I'm going to have to keep an eye on whether we're centered because that screen has gone to sleep. Uh, do you want me to just turn it on? No, 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 it's fine. It'll do it again in 15 minutes if okay. you try to fix it. So there's no point. Um, so I just want to double down on Abby's pitch to buy a copy of the book. If you're thinking of buying it directly through the bookstore, um, nothing's as convenient as Amazon, but there are lots of good reasons to buy straight through the bookstore. And, and the really big one tonight is that a private donor has agreed to match 50% of sales, which is a really big number in the context of book selling um, with donations to a rural health project that uh, Abby mentioned that Stacy's working on. Um, which uh, does a lot of things uh, in, in a lot of different ways. But the one that Stacy and I were just talking about before we started was you had mentioned that they try to reclaim unused, is it commercial or government spaces? Or what are, what are they, they doing? They're trying to put health resources into unused spaces in Appalachia. Yeah, they also, um, we, have, <laughs> we have hospitals closing, um, which is a major problem. And so some of those are being um, uh, reconfigured into rehab centers um, for people struggling with addiction. Um, and I guess in, in general, um, the region is really struggling with its healthcare. And I know that you ha saw a similar thing when you were in Japan. Yeah, did, so when, once the funding is available to do things like this, is there a need for approval from local political authorities? And if so, is, is it difficult to get it or are the buildings typically donated privately? I mean, how do you actually manage to wind up getting access to those spaces? And is it pretty easy once the money is involved or are there other hurdles to jump through? Um, I mean, as far as I understand it, there's a lot of janky stuff going on behind closed doors okay. uh, to make it happen. And there's also a lot of debates around um, the different um, addiction centers, ones that are for profit and ones that are really actually caring about the mm. individuals. So who you're going to give access to. Yeah. So it's, um, it's very contentious. Um, and then, the, you know, each county is 
you know, has a whole different system. And so there isn't a lot of like clear dedicated oversight uh, from the state or um, the federal government. Well, in the part of my book that you read, which is the middle part, which is there are three parts to the book. And the middle part is about elderly people living in Japan's northernmost city. And Japan is currently experiencing record breaking population decline. People are just aging and dying in, in very large numbers. Um, and this is a, is a well, the dog is going to do that. The dog's going to pull out our clip mics. Sorry, bear with us. Um, yeah. And so that's happening all over Japan, but it's happening especially quickly and to an especially dramatic degree in Japan's far north, including in that city. And what makes that city really interesting, besides the fact that I know people there and I like spending time there, is that they took their central train station building, which is really the commercial, it's not only the transit hub in a given Japanese city, but it's also the commercial hub. Usually the main shopping street is connected to it and so on. And they put a nursing home or an elderly care facility inside the train station building, which was really politically contentious there. I mean, the argument that a lot of people on the city council in that city made was you've given up on a future for the place where we live that is anything other than aging. So I wonder if you've seen similar arguments in Appalachia, are there people clinging to an older idea or, or a previous idea of what their communities can be and who aren't eager to see addiction treatment or you know, a different kind of future take shape? I mean, I think people believe that addiction treatment brings in riffraff and usually a homeless population kind of comes with that that may not have existed because these are very rural communities and they're bringing in people from kind of urban places. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that there's, it's clear to everyone that there's a need one thing that, so the outlook in the region is much more realistic than it was even five years ago. So, cause I've been working on this project for 11 years. And so it's this um, fantasy for of coal, right? The, right. This, that it is, it is the most important. In, in Wakanai, in, in this northernmost city, it was, it, it's fishing and specifically crab smuggling, Russian crabbing ships smuggling crabs into the port which doesn't happen anymore. They've lost that money, but they also really cling to an idea of, of the city that comes from that time. Yeah, and so now they know that there was a time where they weren't willing to believe, um, not they, but but people weren't willing to believe that it, that that this, this um, you know, the center of their economy was, was dying. But um, now I think there's a much more practical um, understanding of that. And, you know, healthcare is, one of the so like caring for the sick caring for the elderly that is a stable job for many people mm -hmm. um and and one of the yeah so you have the school district schooling and you have uh health hospital workers it's very noisy in the microphone <laughs> you have the hospital workers they're yeah. the most um they're, they're, they're now the most well-paid people in in the, in the community mm -hmm. and do they when those people come in are they able to integrate in the community and and form relationships and the institution that they're working for through those relationships comes to feel like a genuine part of that community? Or, or do you wind up with the institution feeling kind of separate from the people who live near it? Uh, no, I mean, a lot of the people that I've been meeting, they actually um, went away. They, they grew up in this community and they went away and then were, would return um, to bring resources back. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really surprised to see so much of that. But I think there there are a lot of people in the region who feel very connected, mostly family, familial. Mm -hmm. Do you find that as well in this region? Like a, a, a there's no, because I, I guess I got the sense from the book that there wasn't a big drawback. No, there, you know, there, there isn't. I mean, people who leave tend to stay away and there are different notions in Japan about what kind of responsibility you demonstrate for older generations of your family. And it's not culturally equivalent to the United States, although in some ways it's more attentive. But I think the main thing is just that demographically, there aren't the young people to come back. I mean, the current generation is, is so, so small, but the ultimate outcome is, is similar to what you're describing. Once this nursing home was built inside this train station, and it was not a profoundly um, altruistic institution to put there. It's privately owned. It's fairly expensive by the standards of nursing homes in Japan. And people in Japan are still getting used to the idea that 
the subsidies they receive for things like this and the pensions they receive aren't going to cover it. So it, it isn't quite the same as putting an addiction treatment center in a building like that, but it still wound up striking in the long run. I think most of the people in the city as something really positive that they'd done and they discovered how helpful it was for the people who live there to be deeply involved in the life of the city by virtue of being directly downtown. And so the results seem to me to be the same, that it's an institution that's needed and it employs people in a caring capacity. And even though those people may not always have the best work conditions or be paid extremely well, they're still generally pretty well trained and, and they contribute a lot of things to the city. And, and so um, it, has, it has worked out well. I'm not sure it's worked out well for the politicians who pushed it through because it, it, it exacted a heavy political toll. They were seen as, as it is a city that is very attached to its past and a, a, a pretty economically prosperous past. And to, to give up on that um, requires giving up on, on getting elected again, which, which many of them did. But what's interesting to me about it is in the reviews my book has been getting, even when the review is mixed, that part of the book uh, and those particular stories uh, about that sort of altruistic gesture of, of sort of surrendering an important part of the city to people who are in need, that's the part of the book that reviewers universally respond really well to, which is fascinating because my editors and I, when we were writing that part of the book, were really concerned that it was too complicated. It's very kaleidoscopic in terms of the number of characters it presents. It's not just one clean, direct narrative, but it has turned out to be something that reviewers respond to, I think in large part because people are in all sorts of different contexts looking for, looking to be told that you can transform the place where you live and the results won't be, you won't really lose who you are. In fact, you may find out something about who you are that's really comforting. One thing that I found um, in many communities in Appalachia is to the, um, it looks a, like a place that's very abandoned and desolate. But actually, once you start to spend time there, you realize that there's a really imp like important network of care of churches and um, you know, people who've known each other for many generations or families that have known each other for many generations. And so there actually is this really deep heart. It's, it's actually not a place that's been abandoned. It's a, it's a, it's a place of, of love, care, and it's very alive, but you don't see it. It's, it feels very much like everyone's left. So this is why you and I are talking. I mean, we're talking because there are perceptions of the places that you you document mostly in a number of media, but mostly by photographing them and photographing the people there. And that I document by going there and doing what an, an ethnographer would call participant observation, but I'm just spending time with people and making observations and trying to write about them in a way that amounts to some sort of metaphor or a work of literary art. And um, usually the first thing we have to deal with either when we're thinking about what we're going to write or, or when we're presenting what we've written or photographed to the world is what people think is happening there. And so you've described places that look abandoned and Wakana is certainly one of those places. And another part of my book deals with um, the nuclear industry in Japan. I embedded inside the nuclear industry for several years after Fukushima when people were trying to decide and the regulators were trying to decide which plants would restart. And the place where all the nuclear plants are also looks abandoned except for the nuclear plants at first glance. Um, but it's, that's not really what's, what's happening there. And, and yet these are places where you have to know where to look if you want to understand what kind of lives are occurring there. And perhaps the easiest way to explain this is people who read sort of highbrow periodicals where you're likely to publish photographs when you're doing periodical work or who read books published by my publisher, I think by and large believe themselves to be interested in what you're documenting and the places you're documenting and interested in the stories that I'm telling, but I'm not sure that they would ever go there and try to find out where to look to discover the life of the place them, themselves. So, I mean, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you if when you document the lives of these places, is there any way? Is there are there any simple formulations that have a, have that you've been able to develop 
when you choose what you're going to present to a group of people who haven't been to these places and don't know where the narratives uh, that, that define these towns and cities unfold? Or is it just endlessly complicated and you're still dealing with it? Uh, yes and no. So I, I don't know if you do this, but I, I spend a lot of time looking at the way the region's been covered. Um, so you go to the, the stuff that's out there already. The stuff that's out there now, the stuff that's been out there from, let's say, the start of the war on poverty um, in 1963, 64, and um, up till now, I, I've became, I got really interested in how Appalachia has been portrayed. And that really informs what I do um, because I don't want to replicate it just because as an artist, I don't want to replicate things that I've, you know, seen or, or you know, genres or trends that you know kind of pass through in terms of social sciences let's say um, and and so it, it is interesting and exciting to me to kind of um, look for look at a way of telling these stories about you know we could say poverty um, or disenfranchisement um, in, in a new fresh way. And so what switches you on when you're looking at what's out there already. Do you get switched on when you're angry at what's out there already, when you're intrigued by it, when you know, when you start to see where the hole in that coverage is, you know, you're like, okay, here's the donut and here's, I'm going to go right in the middle here. I mean, what is it that makes you think, okay, I'm beginning to understand what my role is here? Yes. I mean, I definitely have this like great reactionary kind of um, feeling when I read something or see something that is clearly not well developed mm -hmm. um where you know we call it fly, fly in journalism uh but i also find a lot of inspiration in these sort of more meditative works other artists um uh writers who who come to the region or, or live in the region and and write from this place um so i i feel like i need both of them um to anchor me and the, and the work is definitely anchored in both yeah narratives. i understand what you're saying obviously japan has well, not obviously. For those of us who have tried to be part of it, Japan has a really wonderful expatriate literary tradition. You'd be hard pressed, except maybe in France, to find a, a nation where there's a clearer example of very lucid observation being made by multiple writers who come from outside the country and make a very deliberate, sustained, long-term effort to sort of be the outsider moving towards the inside and recording their impressions as they go along. And yet at the same time, it has a big part of what motivated me to write this book and enabled me to finish it over the course of five and a half years was were the constant reminders of how much had been left undone and how foolishly some of that had been left undone. So just to take each section of the book at a time, the first part of the book is about my experiences and also plenty of experiences after I finished doing this, reporting on Japan's African community, primarily its Nigerian community for a newspaper in Tokyo. And what eventually happened within that community was that an, a Nigerian person who'd been detained uh, in, in an immigration detention center starved to death over the course of 25 days uh, um, during a hunger strike. And the way that the government reported the death was fundamentally dishonest and it covered up important elements of the death. And it has led to a series of immigration reforms in Japan that will be adopted this year, premised on the false impressions surrounding his death. And they didn't publish his name in order to prevent what is a pretty docile media in Japan from verifying any of their claims. And I know that I have a lot of connections in that community, so it's easier for me. But it is not rocket science to find out what his name is and demonstrate that many of the government's central claims are false. And in fact, I can name you two reporters, if I wanted to, who had been in rooms with people who could have given them this gentleman's name. His name is Gerald Sonny Okafor. They could have given um, those reporters Sonny's name. And they were in those rooms to talk about Sonny, but they didn't ask the question. And so that's infuriating. And then in the case of, of Japan's northernmost city, which we've been talking about, Wakanai, um, I'm not sure I was quite as angry there, but I was interested that there hadn't been any English language media coverage of 
this nursing home inside the train station and the restructuring of this society when there's lots of English language coverage about Wakanai in a touristic vein in terms of ride to the end of the train line, see something goofy, you know. Um, and then the final part of the book is about Japan's nuclear industry. And when I got there, person after person who worked in that industry would just say to me, can you explain to me as a member of the media, somebody who works in the media or for the press, why everybody in your profession is documenting every minute detail of the cleanup of the Fukushima reactors, which will be decommissioned. It's over. When we have 15 of these things in one tiny part of our prefecture and the majority of them are likely to restart, and it's not clear whether changes in the rules have since Fukushima have made them any safer. What's going on? And I didn't have a good answer for them. And I don't like to be in that position. So that became my determination to spend several years with the nuclear companies and regulators who were negotiating that. And, you know, eventually it came to light and it, that other report over the course of doing this, it came to light that nobody else was working on it. Every once in a while, a good investigative reporter from a Japanese newspaper would pop in and do something but nobody was paying attention to this. And so it's, it's a similar process for me. You try to find good examples, but then you also find yourself thinking, I'm really, I'm really on my own here. Do you think that part of why we kind of are drawn to these types of stories is because we um, kind of cross genres in the way that we do our work? And so what genres do you feel that you, you straddle? <laughs> Fantasy and sci-fi. No, I don't know. Uh, no, one I know, day, I know what you mean. one day, uh, but yeah, um, art and journalism, um, I'm constantly shifting between the two and I'm constantly assessing the failures of each and then trying to um, elevate um, both of them really in um, some sort of version that is um, hybrid, hybrid version. So as you do this for longer and longer and you, you have more and more experience trying to get people to understand that there are limits to each of those forms, especially the journalistic form. And you have, and you really want to do something that combines them or, or improves them or mutually There are just them. as many in the art. In okay. There. okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, but as you do this more and more, do you, do you feel you have any more success either with editors, readers, getting them to understand what it is they're looking at? Or for example, like when you do a photo that you put yourself in, which you do from time to time, do you just get is the response to that still just as confused as it was when you started? And not just specifically that example, but in general, do you find that you're able to have some effect on whether people appreciate, understand what you're trying to do, or is it just, is it pretty flat or has to do more with broader cultural trends? I do think this blending of fact and fiction, I think is kind of making its way um, into a more mainstream storytelling. Um, and I, it's not just fact and fiction, but it's, it's, you know, kind of the blending of high, low, right? Because you're also mixing academic kind of language and in, literary language and journalistic language, right? In the book, or at least that's how I felt uh, reading it, which was, was wonderful. It was so refreshing to have all of these and also very difficult to have them working together. And yet they did. Um, and I do feel like there was a time when I was really embarrassed to show the like self-portraits and, and to talk about that work. And I wouldn't do so with certain types of clients, um, especially mm. ones that um, are, are very rigorous in their, in their photojournalistic ethics. But I now don't feel that sense of fear anymore. So you thought you would be accused of something? Um, I thought that they wouldn't want to hire me because the work, I couldn't do the kind of serious work that they wanted. But let's say that you are a young writer or photographer and you accept those ethics as your gospel, a pretty narrow construction of what truth is and how it has to be presented. And now you're bumping up against what it is people think they know about Japan, which I'm happy to say even in the case of most very well-educated people um, who are totally well-intentioned in their encounters with literature is not really true in any metaphorical or literal sense. So you take this very narrow approach and now you bump up against centuries of accumulated baggage at minimum decades, right? I mean, of accumulated baggage about what 
Appalachia or even just specifically West Virginia is or about what Japan means. Oh, Japan, the modern and the old, you know, all of these tropes. Um, will you ever be able to make a dent? I, I mean, for, I, for me, the answer is, is no. I, I, that's why we live in a moment where people simply don't trust. Well, there are a lot of reasons for this, but people increasingly don't trust what is presented to them within those very narrow boundaries because the, there's a level of, of, of context that, that just can't be there when you're obeying those boundaries. Yes, I, I have a much more optimistic view. Okay. I feel like things are moving into an expanded kind of form of storytelling. And there are um, sort of like one step forward, two step back, you know, like with reality TV and it's kind of obsession with the region. But do you think you feel this way because you work in a visual medium and the internet is really ascendant and I, and I feel pessimistic because I write and I write in a really long format and the internet is going to destroy what I do while it, <laughs> while it simultaneously makes visual communication more effective and efficient. Yes, I mean, over the time that I've been making this work, the visual, visual um, like media has become a more desirable, um, taken a more central role in our culture. Um, and that, <laughs> that may be why I do feel more optimistic, um, but I also just want to believe that I have to believe that there are, that we are having these kinds of conversations across culture about how we are still kind of trapped in these kind of, well, in America kind of in these colonial mindsets um, and how they're still kind of representative everywhere. And, and so I think that for me, photojournalism is directly tied to that. And I, I equate it to the missionaries um, or like what I do to the, to the missionary, like this idea of asserting a right and wrong onto a group of people. It's the same thing that they did. But and so photojournalism, um, not a, a real link. Um, but I, I guess I think, I think there are a lot of interesting writers and photographers um, mixing genres and that is starting to move into mainstream publishing. Hmm. Well, you talk about this this sort of missionary history and the way that there have been these incursions into cult into this this regional culture that you deal primarily in from outside that culture. And as you're doing that, I think a lot about the politics of Japan and the way that they are misconstrued domestically and internationally. And, and the 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 big one is is this question of Japan's pacifist constitution. So Japan is the only advanced democracy in the world that is constitutionally forbidden from engaging in acts of international conflict. And it, it, the article is Article 9. It's very well known. Anybody who's involved with Japan has spent time thinking about it or, or reading about it. It's been undermined through a process of reinterpretation in Japan, but it's still there. So it's still meaningful. And what people will accept as a well-reasoned argument about the need to at least re-examine that part of the constitution is that it was part of the, you know, that that constitution and in particular that article was drafted under U.S. occupation. And so it was dictated as a way to cripple the country by, um, you know, American military interests. But, you, you know, if you actually look into the history and if you have the time, which nobody does, to read academic historians studies, and I'm not only talking about raving Marxists or critical theorists, just mainstream historical studies of the drafting of the Japanese constitution, you'll find that there was this really intricate interplay between the leftist political elements in Japan who had not supported the war effort and therefore were not tried and convicted as war criminals after the war, and who were initially seen as a potentially desirable source of political authority for the occupation, but for the, the occupying army, for the American army. But very quickly, it became clear after the end of the war that we really needed to be worrying about Russia. And so the thought was, let's get rid of these crazy leftists. It doesn't, and, and we'll just make a sort of a Faustian bargain with all of these convicted war criminals. We'll reinstall them. It will make Japan a better bulwark against the growing influence of communism. So then if you look at this pacifist part of the constitution. It, it in fact is not one of the parts of the constitution that whose history or whose underlying history has been most dictated by the occupation authorities. In fact, it's a kind of very genuine expression within the context 
of Japan's constitution, of Japan's own political will, after it suffered this horrifying defeat as the result of this really shoddy ultranationalist leadership, which was then installed again as a puppet regime, right? And that, that ultranationalist leadership is still in place today. And that's the leadership that will now say we have to get rid of this pacifist part of our constitution because it was dictated to us by Americans, when in fact, everything that they want is, is a legacy of American dictation. And, and the pacifism is, is, is uniquely Japanese. I mean, listening to you kind of undo the stereotype, um, yeah, I think it's really beautiful. Um, and I guess that's why we both do the kind of work we do and why I feel some optimism. But I, I was curious about the disconnect um, between um, the way uh, Japan views poverty and disenfranchised uh, people and America. Yeah, so <clears throat> we were talking about this shortly before we logged on. And um, I was telling you that there's a popular sociological argument about Japan, which says it's a society of high responsibility and, and low accountability. And what that means is, and it, it definitely applies in a very direct and concrete way in a place like this city where they use the train station to build a, a, an elderly care facility. It means that central to Japan's democracy is the sense, is, for, is that most people have the sense that most people are being taken care of most of the time and that the welfare system functions effectively in that respect. And in return, they relinquish their need or their desire or their ability to hold the government accountable and to obtain regular transparency from the government. So in other words, as long as most of the population feels that they're likely to be taken care of, they won't demand to know precisely what the government is doing, comparatively speaking, compared to other societies, and they're less likely to complain or seek accountability when they feel things are going wrong. So depending on what you think of that social contract and depending on what you think of the job that Japan's government has done upholding it, you'll either say poverty in Japan tends to be pretty gentle and that it's a, it's a welfare system that does a good job of achieving it. Or you'll say poverty in Japan is not so gentle, but it's very well hidden by the fiction that it's gentle and by some widely disseminated examples of how it can sometimes be gentle. And Norma Field, who is an author I, I, I really deeply admire, and in fact, this book was written in an attempt to follow her in some way, um, has this really wonderful quote where she says, and I'm sure I'll butcher it, that it's considered to be an act of, of terrible wrongheadedness in Japan to object to the quote, solidity of everyday life in a successful society. So if things are going well and most people are taken care of, who would try to make the exceptions more important than the rule? Mm. It, it definitely sounds different and much gentler. Um, we're constantly dismantling our welfare system. Um, we had this really incredible um, period during the war on poverty where we imagined um, it, that it would be eradicated and um, that, you know, pretty much all of the initiatives that were started during that period, during this one time when the government cared about poverty in America, while it was a very affluent after the war, um, it, those are all been dismantled and they've been dismantled by both Republicans and Democrats. Um, so they're both kind of attacking um, the idea of poverty. Um, but right now with Biden, we are starting to see that conversation open up again. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to stick. So that, that's where I'm a little okay. pessimistic. Now, now you're becoming <laughs> a pessimist. Yeah. Well, I'll turn it over to Abby to see if we have any questions, but I just want to plug the book one more time and um, just remind people that if you're interested in buying it, you don't have to buy it tonight, like right now, in order to get a signed copy and uh, to produce the matching donation to Stacy's uh, health project tomorrow, this weekend. Um, go for it. The money will still go to Stacy's work, which will would be wonderful. So thanks for your attention. I'll, I'll turn it over to Abby. All right. Thanks. That was wonderful. And we do have some audience questions. Um, let's see, Stacy. 
I know that a large part of your process is immersing yourself with the subjects of your photos to create comfort and familiarity. How do you confront people about publishing their photos? Um, there are like a lot of questions in, in this one, actually. It's like multi-part, so let's start with that. Like a kind Hold of on. split. We gotta start over again, you were muted. Go on. There's kind of a split um, between the subjects in my work. So there are people that I have developed really long-term relationships with. And then there are people that I just kind of um, see and meet and really encounter only for, let's say, an hour, maybe an afternoon, maybe 10 minutes. And so the, those people that I'm only encountering briefly, I really don't have much contact with them. And I don't get much of an understanding of um, how they feel about the work. But um, although occasionally someone will, will see themselves and, and will reach out to me and, and so shockingly, it's always positive. I think that there's a, there's a sort of nostalgia in seeing yourself a few years ago um, and also represented out in the world in a completely different context than you imagine yourself in the world. So I think it's, it tends to be pretty delightful for people. Um, so you assume they'll feel exploited to a certain degree, but then it doesn't happen as often. I shouldn't say that. I think, I think you know, both happen. Um, but I, I have been surprised at how few people have, have reached out with any kind of anger or aggression. Yeah. Um, but uh, the people that I spend a lot of time with and have developed long-term relationships with, those people I involve in the uh, work uh, all the time. They're constantly critiquing the work, giving me um, really, really useful information um, and also countering certain ideas that I have that or things that aren't coming through that need to um, about the region. And so they play an Im immensely important role. Um, I'm seeing the, the latter part was, was more of a comment, but I'll finish reading it. As a street and documentary photographer myself, I've always loved your work and admired the shameless confidence I see in the way you publish photos and would love to be able to utilize more of that confidence in my own process. So that's just a nice comment. Um, and here's another one. Can you comment on some of the beautiful moments that you've witnessed in your reporting and photographing as you've moved through spaces and interacted with people in their home environments? Beauty. Beauty is always so hard to summon on command. Do you have anything to give me? I want you to go first. <laughs> I, I, I need um, a moment and I, I don't want to use the same moment I used in, in my last event because I must have it more than more than one one moment. You know, I just came back from uh, Nigeria and and when I'm in Nigeria, I'm usually in a city called Aba. And um, there are two cities in Nigeria that, well, more than two, but but mostly two that would call themselves the Japan of Nigeria for, for a wide variety of reasons. And Aba is is one of them. And there are a lot of people in those uh, cities whose family members have gone abroad, particularly to Japan, to try to make a living. So my head is still really in uh, the, that space. Um, and I, in, I went for a walk through the streets of Aba with someone who um, was part of the city's industrial revitalization after that part of the country lost the civil war and the, um, that the city was terribly devastated by bombing campaigns from the Nigerian government and so on. And um, people from his particular village played a really outsized role in rebuilding the city after the war to the extent that it did become a trade and industrial hub again until around 19, the early 90s when, um, when di successive dictatorships in, in Nigerian government really crippled the economy and then things fell apart. And that's when people started going abroad in, in particular to Japan in the case of this community. But um, we walked past buildings that had been burned down in riots by young people from his village who felt that his generation had not passed enough opportunities on to theirs as the economy began to fell apart. And um, 
he had obviously some really painful memories of, of those riots and, and what took place, but he was able to just pause in front of those buildings and say, I don't know if they were right, but I wish they didn't have to leave. And I suppose you had to be there, you know, in the early morning with the fog and, and, and the, these, um, the crows that live in those buildings, which are not like American crows. They're much more visually and auditorily fascinating or orally fascinating. Um, so it was just a moment, but it, it really reduced to a particular set of circumstances in one conversation with one person, this sense of the sadness that people in that city had experienced when all of their dreams of just economic stability, let alone prosperity, had to be outsourced to countries they didn't know anything about and that didn't have any sensitivity toward them or the hardships they'd suffered. So that's a beautiful moment I've had in the recent past. Wow, it would be it's very hard to follow that. That's, no, no. that's stunning. Um, I guess I, I think sometimes about this, um, the time that I first met uh, one, one of my, the, I want to say my subject, the subject in, in the work, um, Pat, who um, plays a prominent role. And he, um, uh, a friend took me to his house, his, um, who is his cousin. And we arrived kind of late in the afternoon. And, you know, if you're a photographer, you know that that's when the light gets very magical. <laughs> and, and so I hadn't really spent a lot of time around everybody. And Pat, was very drunk, as were most people who were at his house hanging out. It was like Friday. And so everyone has long work weeks. And so they really were ready to let loose. And um, Pat starts um, like physically fighting with his um, best friend, Dozer. And um, he smacks his own trailer with a chair because Dozer had like locked himself inside. And he was very angry and I had to take out my camera. Normally I, I would ask first, especially when I'm in, in like a more intimate environment, but I, I did feel like I couldn't miss this opportunity. Um, I'm also just drawn to aggression. Um, because it was so, their relationship, right? I mean, it was really yeah. being dramatized in front of you. Yeah, I think that it was um, this, it was just a genuine experience, a moment that I felt really captivated by and I wanted to be able to share that. And, and so I took the picture and Pat turned around and he didn't know me. I mean, he, he, he was introduced to me, but he didn't really know me. And he screamed at me and he said, get the fuck out of here. You can't take pictures. And I felt awful. I felt fucking awful. Um, and then he calmed down. Um, we were getting ready to leave and he calmed down and he walked over and he said, I'm, I'm very sorry. He's like, um, let's start over. And I think those kinds of um, like going into really complicated situations, situations where access is really difficult and challenging and being able to undo that um, just by being present um, in a way that allows people to feel comfortable around you is, is uh, one of the most beautiful things that um, happens to me in my work. Yeah, because nobody has to, to give you any access. Nobody has to. I mean, it, it's, I think for me, anytime you pause to think about it, it feels again like a miracle that any photograph was ever taken or any story was ever observed in, oh, a, yeah. in a genuine way. I mean, I think the power dynamic is very problematic and it, and it would be the same with a writer. You have a lot of control over the representation of, of people um, and can, you know, take quotes out of context, um, even without meaning to. Um, and so that is something that's endlessly fascinating to me. And I have been yelled at multiple times while making my work. And I will never argue against someone who's yelling at me. They have every right to be upset um, with me taking an image. Mm. That's it. All right, um, here's another one. Drew, I think you mentioned this book was five and a half or six years in the making. Um, so how did finishing it feel? Was it hard to know when it was done? Um, no, it wasn't hard to know when it was done because it was easy to know when it wasn't done. <laughs> um, because you, you would just, you know, nonfiction is very uncooperative and you just, you hit these walls and you know, I, I don't have it yet. Um, well, I guess 
I'm just, I shouldn't generalize because I'm sure we've both read books by people who clearly didn't have it and decided they did have it. And conversely, maybe people who, who were less confident than they should have been. But um, I mean, this book was done across a language gap and without boring you with, you know, my self-hatred about how much Japanese I did or didn't learn while I was living in Japan, I don't speak sufficient Japanese to report alone my own book about geotechnical siting concerns at nuclear plants. That at minimum requires help. And um, book publishers do not, by and large, unless they think there's a really serious legal liability going on, arrange fact checking. So the final phase of working on the book for me was about a two week period of being intensively in touch with a team of seven native level bilingual Japanese and English fact checkers to make sure that I hadn't done anything terribly unjustified or foolish. And um, it was nonstop. I don't think I left my apartment at all uh, or really even left the couch the, where I had, where I was typing emails um, during those two weeks. And I think there was like 72 hours without sleep at the end. So it did feel like a marathon finish. That felt really good. Um, and I hope I would hope for any writer to have at least that moment, if nothing else, where uh, the amount of time invested and the thanklessness of it gives way to a sense that you've actually finished something. I love that. Um, here's another. Drew, congratulations. Can't wait to read the book. Will you describe the social dynamics of doing investigative journalism as an expatriate? How does friendship work when you're writing about your friends? I almost feel like this ties in with Stacy's work as well. Um, you know, I always, I, I, I do wanna hear what Stacy has to say, but I'll give my stock answer, which is, you know you're in a good place when the group of people you're writing about begins to feel no more or less frustrating to you than your friends who you don't write about. So you're neither really enamored of their experiences or tending to think that there's something special or, or other about their experiences, nor are you so crusty about them not showing up when they said they would or otherwise being difficult to deal with that you can't look at them with the same amount of kindness you would reserve for somebody you, you care about. And once you get to that place, it's just like talking to or writing about or being aware of anything else. In terms of the dynamics of being specifically an expatriate writer in Japan, they are endless. And you can, there are so many ways in which you can use that to your advantage by declining to be hemmed in by the social obstacles that are put in place of Japanese writers and reporters. And I'm not even talking about like press clubs and the other things they do formally to restrict reporters access to sensitive information. I'm just speaking socially. And then there are other ways in which it's really difficult because people can wind up giving you really shallow explanations to questions that you're prepared to, to receive substantive and, and nuanced answers to. And just by way of an anecdote to answer the question, when I was um, embedding with the, the nuclear utility company that forms the backbone of the nuclear industry part of the book, they would give us these, you know, bento boxes for lunch every day when we came in to interview people and do scheduling. But they would give us this horrible, extremely formal, very Japanese runaround about the way that access was scheduled. And so uh, my co-reporter, um, Suto Erina, and I went in and I just turned to her and I said, send the bento boxes back today and tell them we're not eating this crap until we actually have direct access to the people we're writing about and they're making their own decisions about how we get access to them in the future. And I didn't think it would work, um, but it did. And so that's a, that's a cross-cultural story uh, about how real those differences and nuances are, even when you think they can't be that simple or that real. I don't know if you have... You have anything on, on, on this? I guess I really do. Um, I think like with the kind of my personal work, I'm always wearing, I guess, the um, friend hat. Um, and that is far more important to me than anything else. The experience is more important than the actual <laughs> work. Um, but it gets very messy and very complicated when I'm working for um, uh, on assignment. Mm. And 
there are times when I'm working on assignment where I'm using friends or people that I've met over the years, like Pat and Dozer. Um, Dozer and his girlfriend, Jamie, I, I spent a year documenting their life um, in 2016 after Trump was elected. And for a publication for The Intercept uh, that is incredibly left, and, and so, it, you know, and here's somebody who is just trying to share their feelings about Trump that are, you know, not, they're not dumb, um, but they're certainly- They're his, he's from a place, he has a life, he has opinions. Yeah, and so how could I make sure that they were protected and they were being given a fair shake in the, or is that even possible in this, um, in, in, this in this context? Mm -hmm. And did you trust your editor? The, the, uh, let's not talk about the periodical itself. I mean, like, did you feel at the beginning, we don't have to get into your relationship with this editor, but when you took the assignment, did you feel like this is going to be thorny? The gap between the remit or, or the, the periodical and the, the people I'm documenting is huge. Or did you feel like there's room for an honest conversation here? Yes. I mean, I, I think I had an exceptional editor on this particular project and she really sort of made it happen um, because she believed that it would be a really useful story for the audience of The Intercept to really get an intimate view of someone who they think they, they don't understand or think that is very different from them. Um, and I do think she stayed really true to that. And the piece itself is really quite beautiful, but um, there, there were still really difficult conversations and difficult moments, um, especially, you know, I, I do a lot of drugs when I'm working. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I didn't want to do that, but that changes my, like during this assignment, and that changes my dynamic mm -hmm. with this group of people that I've known for many years. Um, and so those kinds of things were very slippery. Mm -hmm. Well, sadly, we do have to start wrapping up looking at the time, but would you, either of you, both of you like to share anything about what you're currently working on before we finish up? Um, do you? Yeah, yeah, I have, a, I have a book coming out. We had hoped that it was coming out for this event, but it will be out soon at the latest, I am hoping by the fall. It's um, published by this really wonderful publisher, Twin Palms. It is um, a monograph of the 11 years I've been working in Appalachia. And um, I, I hope that you guys will find your way to it. Yeah, and um, I'm about to go out on submission for my next project, so I should probably keep it mostly secret. It's about Washington, DC. I wanted to do book two about Nigeria. The pandemic makes getting back and forth between Nigeria and anywhere else far too difficult. Um, so um, I, I brought another book project that I am actually very excited about. It's not like it's the second best. I just thought maybe it would be a third or fourth book about Washington, DC, where I'm from back and I'm working on that. And I also don't want to forget before we finish that if you're interested in what we were discussing about the middle part of my book in Japan's northernmost city. Um, I, I have to mention uh, a blogger, actually, shockingly enough, or at least his work is presented in blog format, um, Richard Hendy, whose work on that region of Japan is out there. The Guardian did a version of it. Um, I think he'd probably prefer that you read the original version on his site, which is called Spike, as in like railroad spike Japan. So Spike Japan, easy to Google. And he's done really wonderful work in a very similar vein um, on that part of the world, the same part of Japan wh where um, this city is located. So look for that as well if you're on the internet and need something to read. Well, thanks for that. And keep an eye out for those books, folks. Sounds like we have a, a busy crew here. Um, and that's about it. Thank you both for joining us tonight, Stacy and Drew. This has been just a wonderful conversation. We're so grateful to have had you with us. Every Human Intention is available again in store or online from RJ Julia. Links are there for you in the chat box. And again, as a reminder, we do have signed copies, which is pretty special during a pandemic. So be sure to get your orders in. And that's about it. So thank Thanks so much, Abby. Yeah. Thank you, Abby. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone. everyone.